welcome to the very last lecture in this series. I want to look back at what we've learned throughout the series. A clear picture emerges, one that not only reveals incredible, beautiful and unmistakable design in nature, but ultimately one that also reveals miracles. Do you think that God still performs miracles or do you think it was only meant for the people in biblical times? We believe in an almighty God. Why don't we see miracles anymore? Or have they always been there and we've just not been aware of them? Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. The entrance of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. For all those things my hand has made and all those things exist, say the Lord. The universe is incomprehensibly large, and although astronomers are very clever people, none of them know where the universe begins nor ends. Are we really as clever as we think? Everything around us is made up of atoms, which are made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons. It sounds rather simple, almost uncomplicated. Well, it's easy to understand that electrons move around the nucleus of the atom in discrete orbits, but it's just there where the simplicity ends. If you make any attempt to go even smaller, scientists see some huge challenges with what goes where. This is why it's called quantum mechanics, the branch of physics relating to the very small. It is basically the body of scientific laws that describe the wacky behavior of, for example, photons and electrons, as well as other particles that make up the universe. Through various experiments, it becomes clear that particles appear and disappear in the strangest of places and that the normal rules simply don't apply in this incredibly tiny world, many times smaller than the atom itself. Then there is the question about life. What is it about life that makes it so completely the opposite of something that is non-living? We've spoken about the cells in your body and these cells are found in all living organisms. You've also learned how people in Darwin's time didn't know much about cells at all. In fact, they thought it was just a round little thing filled with protoplasmic fluid. Today, however, we know that every single cell in your body is more complex than a fully functioning city where everything happens in the finest detail with great precision and accuracy. So ask yourself, where does one find those living cells? Are they scattered all over planet Earth? I mean, are they just lying or floating about? Or Do we found, find cells on the moon, on Mars? What about meteors? Do you think cells may be floating around in between galaxies? They cannot, can they? A cell cannot survive on its own, outside of a living being. We don't know if any living beings exist outside of our galaxy, and SETI has searched long, hard, deep and wide for evidence for this, and they're still searching at this stage. And with all the available scientific information currently at our disposal, it seems as though life only occurs here on our special planet Earth. And that life is very complex. If the composition and functioning of a single cell is more complex than an entire city, how many people were required to build that city? We already know that not even the most advanced computer is able to build another cell. No, th no one can. Only a cell can build another cell. And the cell can repair itself if something goes wrong. In other words, all cells come from other cells. Omnicellulous, e-cellulous, which means life comes from life. According to the law of biogenesis, as laid down by Virchow and Pasteur, and as determined by Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the author of life. Can a car fix itself when something breaks? Is it able to duplicate or reproduce itself and have a new, new one pop out in a flash? That would be fantastic, but why not? Because the vehicle is non-living. Now you probably know what my next question is going to be. We've asked it before. 
where did the first cell come from and who made that cell? Nobody knows how a mixture of lifeless chemicals spontaneously organized themselves into the first living cell. That is Professor Paul Davies, the new scientist. Listen to this astonishingly honest remark by Professor Andrew Knoll from Harvard. We don't really know how life originated on this planet. Now when looking at something as complex as the engine of a car, you don't doubt the fact that someone designed that engine. The engine designer is far more intelligent than the engine itself. Back to that little cell which is thousands of times more complex than the engine of a car. Who or what made the first cell? Did it happen by accident over a very long time? It seems completely impossible to me, as so many thousands of other scientists have discovered. A cell cannot survive on its own. It must be complete and fully functioning with it within a complete and fully functioning living being. When we look at the design of all the complex living organisms around us and also in the non-living matter, why would we even consider the possibility that there is no designer? So let's get back to the original point. Could it be that life itself is a miracle? There are many things that have been made by man, but who made all the living beings? They are basically everywhere on the planet. The answer is actually quite obvious. An extremely complex being with immensely complex little cells was created by a far more intelligent and unfathomably almighty designer. And the words all the living creatures on earth sounds very familiar, just as familiar as the first few verses of Genesis. Could it be that the almighty God is the intelligent master designer? With my feet firmly anchored in the word of the living God, and confirmed by everything we have learned, I am left with no other possibility. To conclude this series, let's have a look at a last few desperate attempts by evolutionists to prove their hypothesis. Charles Darwin said, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. Enter the mousetrap. Do you think that the concept of a mousetrap might result in a breakdown of Darwin's theory? It seems so simple, consisting of only five pieces, a wooden platform, a hammer, a spring, a holding bar, and a trigger. Indeed, this little trap is a brilliant example of irreducible complexity. A single system composed of several well-matched interactive parts that contribute to the basic function. Michael Behe explains that if any part of the system is removed, you won't be able to catch that mouse. In other words, the mousetrap cannot function as a mousetrap. You have to have all the components together with the right materials, shapes and accurate placement configuration for it to function successfully. It would take some stretch of imagination to believe that the mousetrap evolved piece by piece. And since it can only accomplish its purpose with all five pieces present and in the correct configuration, it is irreducibly complex. In other words, you cannot reduce its complexity without entirely destroying its function. By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and all their host by the breath of his mouth for he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. The statement in Psalms 33, 6 and 9 is in perfect harmony with Genesis 1, describing how the Creator God created entire subsystems of life instantaneously by the command of his word. He designed, created and placed irreducibly complex systems in operation all at once or else these systems would not have functioned. So let's get back to Darwin's challenge. If it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. 
Do living organisms have vital organs, vital functions that require all parts to be there at once, meaning it could not be derived gradually by a series of useful intermediates? Darwin, your theory is about to be broken down. Again, there are many examples, including the complex cell, the flagellum, the design of tears, the complex sonar system of dolphins and bats, the genetic coding system, etc., etc., that are irreducibly complex. Let's read this quote by a Nobel laureate in medicine, Jacques Monod. But the major problem is the origin of the genetic code and of its translation mechanism. The code is meaningless unless translated. The modern cell's translating machinery consists of at least 50 macromolecular components which are themselves coded in DNA. The code cannot be translated otherwise than by products of translation. When and how did this circle become closed? It is exceedingly difficult to imagine. In other words, the instructions for making proteins that are encoded in the DNA can't be decoded unless you've already made some proteins using those machines to make the proteins. It's like having a CD with instructions on the CD telling you how to make the CD. So how do you make the CD? DNA could not have come about by random processes because it is irreducibly complex. The defense system of the Bombardier Beetle in blasting scalding acid at its enemy is another exciting example of an irreducibly complex system. How is it possible for this little beetle to keep boiling acid in its body without seriously damaging itself? Through chemistry, the boiling acid is produced at the very moment the beetle ejects its fluid. Two chemicals, hydrogen peroxide and hydroquinone, are produced by special glands within the abdomen and stored together in a collecting vesicle, a storage room. Those two chemicals can only produce an explosive reaction when mixed together under the influence of a special enzyme catalyst. When danger approaches, the beetle releases the mixture into an explosion chamber. It's like an asbestos-lined firing chamber. And at the same time, the catalyst is squirted into the chamber from the surrounding glands. These reactions release an enormous amount of heat, the temperature of the solution rising to boiling point with a portion even vaporizing as steam. If the mixture didn't have anywhere to go, the insect would blast itself to pieces. This is solved by twin tail tubes, which can aim in any direction, as you know by now. The explosion actually consists of a series of about a thousand extremely rapid tiny explosions that sound like one pop, since the power of a single explosion would blast the little beetle itself right out of there. Now this was discovered in the 1980s and 1990s by Tom Eisner, a chemical ecologist at Cornell University in the United States. He used a high-speed camera to film how the insect sprays. This clearly showed that the noxious mixture is not ejected continuously, but rather it is fired out in a high-frequency series of explosions. This is similar to pulse combustion, where a limited amount of fuel and air ignite in a combustion chamber. This causes the pressure inside the chamber to rise due to the heat and that is produced when this mixture reacts. Once the pressure is high enough, and the pressurized gases are released and used to propel, for example, a rocket. More air and more fuel are allowed into the chamber and the whole process repeats itself. Now this unique system of this little beetle has inspired award-winning research into a new generation of technology. A retired professor of thermodynamics and combustion theory at the University of Leeds, Professor Andy McIntosh and his team were elated to learn of Eisner's work and this example of true combustion in nature. He then led a team of scientists to develop a technology which is based on the beetle's spray mechanism.
They propose that it may lead to improvements in the automotive and health industries, such as new types of nebulizers, needle-free injections, which I would be extremely happy about, fire extinguishers, and powerful fuel injection systems. For their work, they have received the Outstanding Contribution to Innovation and Technology title at the Times Higher Education Awards in London. Now this irreducibly complex mechanism cannot function unless several substances and structures are present in the right configuration and at the same time. Otherwise the beetle would have blown itself to pieces at various different stages. There's no way a slow gradual process can explain or produce this little bug. Now talk is cheap, so let's look at the following video with special thanks and credit to Steve Grison from Exploration Films. Exploration Films. Check us out on the web at explorationfilms.com. So. Exploration Films, where curious truths and uncommon minds meet. The eye is another example of an irreducibly complex system. Evolutionists have not been able to understand how eyes and vision evolved. Neither how an organism with one type of eye descended from an organism with another type of eye. Even Darwin admitted to this problem and stated, To suppose that the eye, with all its inimitable contrivance for adjusting the focus to different distances, for admitting different amounts of light and for the correction of spherical and chromatic aberration could have been formed by natural selection seems, I freely confess, absurd in the highest possible degree. Yet Darwin was confident that this problem could be solved. It was not insurmountable and with his evolutionary enthusiasm he compiled a three-page proposal of intermediate stages and gradual steps through which eyes may have evolved. This was really a discussion of various animal eyes where he suggests that natural selection could bring about gradual changes from single-celled light-sensitive eyes, for example in jellyfish, to the concave grouping of light-sensitive cells in the eyes of starfish, to the ball of cells with a crude lens in snails, to the fantastic eyes of birds and humans. Interesting how Darwin never did answer these two questions. How did the simplest light-sensitive spot come into existence and how did vision begin? Each of the anatomical steps and structures that Darwin thought were so simple actually involve immensely complicated biochemical processes that cannot be explained away so easily. A single plant, a single animal, would require thousands and thousands of lucky appropriate events. Thus, miracles would become the rule. What gambler would be crazy enough to play roulette with random evolution? The probability of dust carried by the wind reproducing Dura's melancholia is less infinitesimal than the probability of copy errors in the DNA molecule leading to the formation of the eye. Besides, these errors had no relationship whatsoever with the function that the eye would have to perform or was starting to perform. There is no law against daydreaming, but science must not indulge in it. Have you ever stared deeply into the eyes of a fly? On each side of its head we find a compound eye, which means that each eye consists of thousands of tiny little eyes. This enables to the fly to see more than one image instead of only one like us. Yet there are other insects that also have compound eyes, but these are compiled differently. The eyes are so complex and perfect that there is simply no way in which they could have evolved. For example, deep in the ocean we find the small mantis shrimp with very complex compound eyes, but their thousands of eyes within an eye focuses onto a single point, just like ours. In addition, scientists discovered that some of these animals have lens cylinders in their eyes to bend the light evenly. They also have a very complex mirror system, too difficult for me to attempt to explain. 
Yet they want us to believe that these little shrimps work that out all by themselves. With such fantastic capabilities, and to quote Dr. Jonathan Sarfati, NASA ought to hire some of them to invent, invent better telemetry systems in their rockets. This little shrimp has the most complex color vision system in the world, where people have only three color receptors, red, green, and blue. The shrimp has 12, of which four can see into the ultraviolet spectrum, something which, which we certainly cannot do, and that is just a mere low-life little shrimp. We are dealing with the work of a master designer, one who used very complex mathematics to accurately calculate all the angles and design the right structure with the use of evenly complicated physics and chemistry. How could those eyes have evolved? Until they work perfectly, they could not work at all. Nothing works until everything works. Remember, you cannot reduce its complexity without entirely destroying its function. If the little shrimp's eyes evolved through natural processes over millions of years, you would not have been able to see anything until it was working perfectly. Meanwhile, he is surrounded by everything that wants to devour him. How would he have survived? Let's try Darwin's principle of survival of the fittest. Do you still remember that circle? Blind shrimps constantly bumping into their enemies is not fit enough to survive for very long. So which one will survive then? Well, the one that is least blind. Which one is the least blind? The one that survives, silly. On page 588 of his book, Richard Dawkins states that the eye supposedly evolved independently as many as 40 to 60 different times. Given the small probability of even a single eye ev evolving or the evolution of any organism at all, the suggestion of it occurring numerous times is indefensible. Advanced vision seems to appear almost at the very beginning of the fossil record, with the oldest eye fossil belonging to a trilobite, a complex compound eye dating back to the Cambrian, supposedly 540 million years ago. More precisely, the fossil record shows that eyes were very complex since the beginning. Furthermore, nearly all modern phyla rapidly came into existence with fully formed eyes. You see, there really is no long evolutionary fairy tale behind the eye. The gradual development of the eye is impossible due to the extremely sophisticated and interdependent features. It is simply too complex to have happened by accident. The curious thing, however, about the evolution of the vertebrate eye is the apparent suddenness of its appearance and the elaboration of its structures in its earliest known stages. Michael Behe invites the reader of his book to imagine the following scenario. You enter a room and you see a body crushed on the floor flat as a pancake. You observe how a dozen detectors crawl around examining the floor in great detail with their magnifying glasses for any clue as to the identity of the perpetrator. In the middle of the room, right next to the pancake body, stands an enormous grey elephant. There is an elephant in a global laboratory full of scientists who are trying to explain the development of life. The elephant is labelled intelligent design, yet they still can't see him. Biochemical systems were designed not by chance, nor necessity, nor the laws of nature, but they were planned and designed by the master designer. Homo means the same, and certainly not in the way it is misinterpreted today. Homology is the study of similarities in anatomy and physiology of different kinds of organisms and was probably first popularized by Huxley in 1863. Huxley was well known as Darwin's bulldog. The fact that similarities exist when certain aspects of life forms are compared is quite obvious. For example, humans and various animals have a heart, liver, two eyes, two ears, four limbs and five digits, fingers and toes, amongst others. 
The seven vertebrae in the human neck are basically similar to that of the giraffe seven, even though the gi giraffe vertebrae are much larger than ours. Evolution is referred to these as homologies or homologous organs or structures. The question, however, is whether the similarity that exists proves that one structure evolved into another, that less complex evolved into more complex. Now, the most obvious explanation for similarity in living beings is that the requirements of life are similar for similar living organisms. The conclusion drawn from this by evolutionists are that these similarities are there because of common ancestry, common descent, and provide com a compelling line of evidence for the hypothesis that we evolved from a common ancestor. Darwin devoted an entire book, The Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex, to the idea that humans have common descent with apes and other animals. This, hom this argument homology as proof for Darwinism has been used in high school textbooks for generations. My daughter is writing her matric in this year and I can guarantee that the examples proposed by evolutionists of homology and that we are going to look at now is still in their syllabus. The most common similarity often cited by evolutionists is the pentadactyl limb. This is the so-called five-boned arm and leg belonging to almost every land-living vertebrae animal. Actually, there are a lot more than five bones, but the pattern has been simplified. In reality, it consists of the upper arm, two forearms, eight wrist bones, five hand palm bones, and 14 finger bones. 30 bones, not five. According to evolutionists, the forearm of humans had a similar arrangement to that of a frog, a reptile, the front leg of the horse, and the membrane wing of the bat. Humans and frogs both have five digits, fingers and toes, on each limb. But if we believe that the reason behind this is because we are all descended from a common ancestor, we could reasonably expect that the digits grew in a similar manner, don't you think? In other words, we would expect the embryonic development of the digits in humans and frogs to be basically the same, the same as the common ancestor they supposedly descended from. Yet the digit development in humans and frogs is completely different. Humans start off with a spade-like structure, with the fingers and toes developing through the material, which dissolves away. In other words, mater material between the digits is removed. In frogs, the digits grow outwardly, but independent from buds, so material is added. If evolution provided the correct explanation of the five-digit similarity between frogs and humans, we would expect not only the similarity, but also the same process of digit development to be similar, since similarity is supposed to be there due to shared genes, common descent. The so-called pentadactyl limb is as much a made-up term as the so-called missing links that is supposed to prove evolution. Think for a moment about the movement of the upper and lower arm as well as the hand. It functions according to the best possible design, meaning there is no better design for it. Design does not provide evidence of thoughtless, random evolution, but rather the opposite purposeful creation. Although evolutionists happily use this argument in their attempts to prove evolution, it should be clear to you that similarity between different kinds is not what they need. They need evidence of changes between kinds, not similarities in structure and function of various organs. Without these evidences, their attempt to prove their hypothesis is weak at its best. What they do manage to do is to divert your attention even further away from the truth. The physical similarities have two possible causes. Either it shows that the various kinds are related, or that a single designer with infinite intelligence and power created the basic kinds of living systems based on a similar design, each specifically modified or adapted to enable it to survive in its own unique environmental niche. The niche is the function performed in the environment. The evolutionary hypothesis is based on 
very few and outdated scientific proposals from the 19th century. Almost all they had in those days were arms and legs. A huge amount of biological evidence has, uh, and using new research techniques has been collected since. But because the 20th century science provided no additional information in support of the hypothesis, some evolutionists still stubbornly cling to arms and legs as primary proof of evolution. During the 19th century, Ernest Haeckel was one of the most enthusiastic supporters of Darwin's concept of evolution. He was a professor in zoology, a marine biologist, as well as a qualified medical doctor at the University of Jena. In a letter to a loved one, Haeckel explained how he was once a Christian, but after studying evolution he became a free-thinking pantheist. Pantheists believe that God is in everything and therefore identifiable with the universe, its powers and its laws. Accordingly, everything possesses a form of godliness, even this table. Taylor wrote the following about Haeckel. He became Darwin's chief European apostle, proclaiming the gospel of evolution with evangelistic fervor, not only to the university intelligentsia, but to the common man by popular books and to the working classes by lectures in rented halls. Haeckel was the first person to put together an evolutionary family tree for humanity. To fill the gaps between inorganic, non-living matter and the first signs of life, he conjured up a series of miniature protoplasmic organisms that he called Munira. He described these hypothetical creatures as not composed of any organs at all, but consist entirely of shapeless, simple, homogeneous matter, nothing more than a shapeless, mobile little lump of mucus or slime consisting of albuminous combinations of carbon. Haeckel is, however, mostly famous for his fraudulent diagrams. In 1868, based on his enthusiastic support of Huxley's idea of abiogenesis, the idea that life comes from non-life, he produced a whole range of fake diagrams in which he compared the so-called similarities of human embryos with animals, a bird, a pig and a fish, as proof that everything alive had one common ancestor. The human embryos are initially depicted as identical to those of various animals, after which it goes through a whole range of evolutionary changes, including having gills like a fish, a tail like an ape, etc. It follows that a human embryo supposedly passes through a fish stage, an amphibious stage, a reptile stage, and so on. It is often referred to as the law of recapitulation, or Haeckel's term, the biogenetic law, which implies that the individual embryo repeats its so-called evolutionary history. Well, that law, the biogenetic law, does not exist. And the whole idea is today dismissed as false. No wonder he struggled so much to find anatomical evidence in support of his idea. But since he was never one to allow a lack of evidence to stand in his way, he simply conjured up some drawings of embryos by altering the ones that were made by other scientists. In 1874, Professor Hess pointed out Haeckel's fraudulent al alterations. This year, 2017, that is 143 years ago. Professor Hiss sarcastically referred to the fact that since Haeckel taught at Jena, home at the time of the finest optical equipment available, Haeckel had no excuse for his inaccuracy. Professor Hiss further said that anyone who engaged in such blatant fraud forfeited all respect and essentially eliminated himself from the ranks of scientific research workers of any stature. Haeckel even admitted that he was guilty. A small portion of my embryo pictures, possibly six or eight in a hundred, are really in Dr. Bress, uh, one of his critic sense of the word falsified. All those, namely in which the disclosed material for inspection is so incomplete or insufficient that one is compelled in a restoration of a connected development series to fill up the gaps through hypotheses and to reconstruct the missing members through comparative synthesis. 
What difficulties this task encounters and how easily the draftsman may blunder in it, the embryologist alone can judge. Michael Richardson was a lecturer and embryologist at the St. George's Hospital Medical School in London. Currently, he's a professor of animal development at Leiden University in the Netherlands. Even though he is not a creationist, he said that he always knew something was wrong with Haeckel's drawings, since they didn't square with Richardson's understanding of the rate at which fish, reptiles, birds and mammals develop their distinctive features. There is no record of anyone actually comparing embryos of species. No one has cited any comparative support of this idea. So Professor Richardson assembled an international team to examine and photograph the external form of 39 embryos from a wide range of vertebrate species at a stage comparable to that depicted by Haeckel. They published their results in 1997 already. Now this photo, with thanks and appreciation to Professor Richardson, shows how the different creatures that they investigated were all very different, so radically different, that Haeckel's drawings of similar looking embryos could not possibly have been done from real specimens. Nigel Hawkes interviewed Richardson for the Times uh, in London in an article where Richardson described Haeckel as an embryonic liar. This is one of the worst cases of scientific fraud. It's shocking to find that somebody one thought was a great scientist was deliberately misleading. It makes me angry. What Haeckel did was to take a human embryo and copy it pretending that the salamander and the pig and all the others look the same at the same stage of development. They don't. These are facts. I want to repeat, Professor Richardson is not a creationist. And today, one of the most tragic consequences of this idea is the argument that the fish is only in the fish phase, so you're only slicing up a fish is still used by some abortionists to convince young girls and women that killing their babies is okay. The atheist Carl Sagan describes it as follows. By the third week, it looks like a little segmented worm. By the end of the fourth week, something like the gill arches of a fish or an amphibian have become conspicuous. By the sixth week, reptilian face. By the end of the seventh week, the face is mammalian, but somewhat pig-like. By the end of the eighth week, the face resembles a primate, but is still not quite human. A human embryo never looks reptilian or pig-like. A human embryo is always a human embryo. From the moment of conception, it is never anything else. It does not become human sometime after eight weeks. The unborn baby is a tiny human child. We can justifiably charge this evolutionary nonsense of recapitulation with responsibility for the slaughter of millions of helpless prenatal children, or at least for giving it a pseudoscientific rationale. About a half a century ago, when the amazing mechanism of the human immune system was being discovered, Nobel Prize winning biologist Sir Peter Medawar declared that the survival of a child in a mother's womb contradicted immunological laws. The immune system normally detects foreign tissue in the body and reacts by immediately setting up a defense against it, the killer T cell me mechanism, which attacks the foreign tissue. Since the developing embryo is genetically distinct, in other words, foreign, we would expect the mother's immune system to attack it. We know today that this really does happen. Yet the developing baby survives the killer T cell attack by putting up a very specific defense mechanism. Researchers at the Medical College of Georgia discovered that mammalian embryos produce a special enzyme that suppresses the mother's killer T cell mechanism just before the embryo attaches to the, to the mother's uterus. 
Interestingly, in human embryos, this happens on day six, which is a preparation day for day seven, when the embryo first attaches itself to its mother's womb so that it can draw with nutrients from, from its mother's bloodstream. This is also the exact time when the mother's killer T cells would normally begin to attack and reject the embryo, were it not for the production of the special enzyme on day six. Interestingly, day six of the week is also a preparation day for day seven, the Sabbath of the Lord. One of the major arguments used by abortionists is that it, the embryo is just part of the mother's body and she can do with her body as she pleases. Yet this research clearly shows that right from the beginning, the human embryo is not part of the mother's body. From the moment of conception, it has a unique and distinct genetic makeup with half of the chromosomes from mom and the other half from dad, recombining in unique combinations. The very reason why the mother's defense system will identify it as foreign. The tiny unborn baby is an entirely separate entity, completely human from the very beginning and we have no right to even contemplate ending his or her life. Exodus 20, 12. You shall not murder. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Let's briefly look at this because it can be confusing. Only the first one, the law of biogenesis, is valid and true. And it basically says that life comes from life. We will look at how this has been proven. The biogenetic law, or Haeckel's law of recapitulation, is the law that does not exist. This is the discredited idea that embryonic development is a brief repetition of evolutionary development. Abiogenesis is Huxley's new term for spontaneous generation. A means without and bio means life. This is the discredited belief that living organisms can somehow be produced by non-living matter. Now let's have another look at abiogenesis, the belief that living organisms can somehow be produced by non-living matter. So given the right conditions and precursors, life would arise or be generated all by itself, spontaneously. There were various recipes for this well-established so-called fact of science. According to this view, worms, flies or even mice would simply spring forth from decaying meat, grain, or other materials. For example, it was also thought that meat left to rot would spontaneously give rise to maggots and flies. This established the belief in spontaneous generation of maggots and flies from rotting meat. Francesco Reddy proposed a very simple experiment to test this hypothesis. Let's cover the meat with some fine material and see what happens. Well, of course, no maggots or flies swarmed from the meat as it rotted because no flies could get to the meat to lay the eggs, which produces maggots. And so Reddy overthrew the long-established scientific doctrine and replaced it with a new doctrine that was later formulated by Pasteur and Virchow as life comes from life, what became known as the law of biogenesis. Pasteur banged the final nail in the coffin of spontaneous generation when he carried out his famous swan-necked beaker experiment. He placed a sterilized meat broth in his beaker and he then heated the thin neck of the, be of the beaker and bent it downwards like the neck of a swan. While the bent neck allowed air to get to the broth, it prevented anything dropping into the broth from the air. So the broth stayed clear for a year establishing the fact that a sterilized broth open to the air without any protection such as with a swan neck would be contaminated by pre-existing life forms falling into it from the air even though these were invisible to the naked eye. Pasteur definitively showed that microbes did not arise in a sterile meat broth until and unless other microbes had access to it. 
Pasteur and the great pathologist Rudolf Virchow formulated what later became known as the law of biogenesis, life comes from life. The implication of this research was that life does not create itself, it required God to create it originally. By the way, both of these Christian men were creationists. Let's get back to Haeckel. We are not done with him yet. Professor Keith Thompson from Yale said the following regarding Haeckel's fraudulent drawings and the biogenetic law. Surely the biogenetic law, which refers to Haeckel's fraudulent drawings, is as dead as a door now. It was finally exercised from biology textbooks in the 50s. As a topic of serious theoretical inquiry, it was extinct in the 20s. It would be great if that were true, because even though scientists exposed Haeckel's fraud and accused him in a court of law of falsely altering these illustrations, and contrary to what Professor Thompson thought, those diagrams actually still appear in some school books today, definitely in textbooks from the 1990s. As recently as October 2012, a major matric examination in New South Wales, Australia had a question pertaining to Haeckel's fraudulent embryo drawings. Now let's get a bit closer to home. When last did you have a sneak peek at your children's school textbooks? As mentioned, my daughter is currently writing her matric. She's in a very popular high school in Pretoria, South Africa. In fact, this school was named the best academic high school more than once. But this is not about the school. Most parents are not aware of this. Hackle's fraud was already exposed in 1874 by his evolutionary colleagues. He had already been charged with fraud. This has been thoroughly falsified through recent comparative studies done by an evolutionist, Professor Richardson. Yet, here is a copy of a page from my daughter's grade 12 notes on evolution. I took this picture two weeks ago. This is the year 2017. And I repeat, this is 143 years after this was shown to be fraudulent. Even I was shocked. You know, I expected the usual pentadactyl limb, the Galapagos finches, Lamarck's giraffes, etc. But I was truly shocked to see how uninformed and careless our Department of Education really is on this subject. Why is this, I almost said, rubbish still in our children's syllabus? Why do we need to waste money on such nonsense, blatant lies and purely pseudoscientific garbage? The evolutionist Susan Mazur calls attention to the existing censorship against non-Darwinian ideas. She opposes the censorship, and rightly so. Thus the public is unaware that its dollars are being squandered on funding of mediocre middle-brow science, or that its children are being intellectually starved as a result of outdated texts and unenlightened teachers. On a very lighter note, human reasoning was always of a far greater importance to Haeckel than facts and evidence. He believed that the main difference between people and apes were that apes could not speak. He even conjured up a fictional lost ape man with the name Pithecanthropus alalus, meaning speechless ape man. And he had an artist made a drawing of this speechless ape man without a thread of evidence to support it. The Dutch professor and scientist, Professor von Koningswald, was comical in his critique of Haeckel's illustration and naming of a creature of which there is not a shred of evidence. Under a tree, a woman with long lank hair sits cross-legged suckling a child. Her nose is flat her lips thick, her feet large with a big toe set considerably lower than the rest. Beside her stands her husband, fat-bellied and low-browed, his back thickly covered with hair. He looks at the spectator good-naturedly and unintelligently with the suspicious expression of an inverted toper, 
habitual drinker. It must have been a happy marriage. His wife could not contradict him, for neither of them could speak. Similarities in species provide no proof for evolution. Creation is believed that commonality of various features across distinct kinds amounts to economy of design, a common feature of good manufacturing practice and indicative of a common designer, the creator God. The fact that all life shares the same planet and unrelated species have many biological systems in common to suit a particular environment means that creationists would expect to find many similarities in the DNA of unrelated species. Chimpanzees have more biological similarities to humans than fish. So we would expect to find a lot more similarity between the DNA of chimps and humans than between fish and humans. But it does not mean that we are related to chimps by common ancestry or that humans are advanced chimps. As stated by Steve Jones, we also share about 50% of our DNA with bananas and that doesn't make us half bananas, either from the waist up or the waist down. The genetic differences are really what is significant and creationists maintain that these strongly indicate distinct created kinds. The classic example referred to by Darwin, the pentadactyl limb, and cited in hundreds of textbooks as proof for evolution is seriously flawed as an example of homology, since the four limbs often develop from different body segments in different species in a pattern that cannot be explained by evolution. Comparative anatomy fails completely when an attempt is made to trace all life forms, including fossils, back to their supposed universal common ancestor, since few skeleton, muscle and brain counterparts exist in single-celled animals. It is homology that Darwinists rely on to bridge the gaps in the fossil record. It is homology that underlines the diagrams drawn up by Darwinists from Haeckel to the present day, showing how every living thing is related. Ultimately, however, it is homology that has provided the greatest stumbling block to Darwinian theory, for at the final and most crucial hurdle, homology has fallen. And so their search for Grandpa continues. You think we're going to find him? You know what? There is at least one thing that we can agree with, with evolutionists, and we, that is that we do have a common ancestor, a human, and his name was Adam. Similarities, homology, provide no proof of evolution. All that is proven is that the same general form performs the same general function, which brings us to purposeful design by an intelligent designer. Sean Doyle wrote, the capacity that humans have for willing ignorance is astounding at times. It amounts to saying, it looks like a duck, it sounds like a duck, it feels like a duck, it's clearly a rock. Time for an experiment for our children. Let's step into mom's kitchen. On closer inspection, you will discover all sorts of interesting things such as cutlery. Small spoons, large spoons, five or six types of knives, forks, and so forth. Now, would you assume that the larger spoons evolved from the smaller spoons? Of course not. That would be quite silly. What does it show then? An intelligent person designed the cutlery and each one was made for a specific purpose. Purposeful design by an intelligent designer. The similarities that you see in the bones of the forearms of humans, the frontal limbs of horses, reptiles, frogs and bats have everything to do with the purpose for which they were designed. The cutlery did not make itself nor was it the result of a chance arrangement of molecules. It was designed by a designer. Even if machinery was used in the manufacturing, someone with intelligence designed the machines. Whether it is similarity in eyes, arms, hearts, lungs or tongues, the answer is creation, based on a specific basic recipe for a specific purpose. Different animals also have anatomical components or features that differ completely from that of other animals. If this was not the case, all animals would have looked the same. 
Now let's have a look at dogs and cats. Although they have many of the same features or components, they still com differ completely. When we really start to look at all those differences, the whole idea of one common ancestor for all living organisms starts to fade into oblivion rapidly. Now add to that the complete absence of any fossil or other evidence of one kind changing into another kind over millions of years, and we once again come back to the almighty, all-knowing, intelligent design, designer and creator God. It is quite clear that wherever we look in nature, we find organized diversity. Everything differs, but in the most perfect way. Even these differences provide evidence of an intelligent desire, designer who unquestionably delights in diversity. Copying the work of any other person or their design without giving them due credit is called plagiarism. But even though this is regarded as a serious offense, it has actually inspired a whole new field of science called biomimetics. And as the name suggests, it involves copying or mimicking design as seen in the biological world. For example, the fantastic geometric eyes of lobsters have inspired X-ray telescope design. And the amazing properties of spider silk are inspiring chemists in the development of extremely strong materials. In fact, spider silk is stronger and more elastic than Kevlar, which is the strongest man-made fiber. The main support for its web is in the form of dragline silk, which is a hundred times stronger than steel. If you could make a cable as thick as your hose pipe, from this material, it could support the weight of two Boeing 737 aircrafts. The spider spinnerets use liquid crystal technology that is more advanced than any of our industrial processes. The gecko's, the gecko's feet can stick to most polished surfaces through tiny hairs called setae, of which the tips subdivide into spatulae that exploit the tiny forces between the molecules. The design of such a fine structure is simply beyond the limits of human technology. Ant and bee feet stick by means of an elaborate rotating mechanical and hydraulic system that extends the sticky pad into place, inflating it. Scientists are continually discovering more fantastic examples of design in nature and copying them. Where there's design, there's a designer. Yet. Copying the work of the designer without giving him due credit would also amount to a form of plagiarism, don't you think? Doesn't it make sense that we should give credit, due credit, to the master designer? Romans 1, 20 to 21. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. If similarity in design supports evolutionary assumptions, it is listed as a homology and accepted as evidence for evolution. If the design does not support evolution, it is labeled as an analogy and it is concluded that the similarity exists because a certain design is highly functional for a specific body part and not because of common ancestry. Now many of these analogous structures are assumed to exist because of convergent evolution, whereby it is assumed that separate evolution of similar structures occurred because of similar environmental demands. In other words, some similarities between distant species are supposedly caused by adaptation to similar environments. Convergent evolution is further used to explain similar structures that form from different embryonic structures. So this is a phenomenon where different animals have the same organs structures that appear similar superficially, yet differ significantly in anatomy and physiology. We will now look at wings as an example of similarities in completely different organisms that could not have evolved from each other. 
The evolutionist argument from homology lacks scientific content. This particular lack has very serious implications. It strikes at the root of all attempts by evolutionists to give homology an objective basis and distinguish homology, similarities due to descent, from analogy, similarities not due to descent. The only way they can recognize analogous variation, especially when due to convergent evolution, is by criteria, for example genetic or embryological, which we now know do not hold for organs of unquestionable homology. The evolutionist concept of homology is now shown to be entirely subjective. Now, one of the most commonly proposed examples of convergent evolution is wing evolution. Accordingly, which wings are believed to have evolved a minimum of four times independently by different animals, insects, bats, reptiles and birds. The evolutionary progenitors to birds are still highly debated among evolutionists. The most common theory suggests that birds evolved from dinosaurs or other reptiles. The lack of fossil evidence forced evolutionists to conclude that bird wings did not evolve from insect wings. Therefore, the wings, and bird, wings of birds and the wings of insects are not, not labelled as homologous but as analogous. Instead of accepting the fact that homology is hereby falsified, they conjure up a new label, convergent evolution. Have you ever taken the time to really look at a wing? It is one of the most complex structures that, that there is, combining fascinating folding and unfolding structures with special aerodynamic principles making flight possible. So in its simplest form, and on a much lighter note, the evolutionary wing development process hypothetically went like this. One day, long, long ago, by pure coincidence, an insect managed to grow himself, herself, a pair of wings. I wish I could do that. This is supposed to be the first discovery ever of flight. Keep in mind how fantastic this insect's ability must have been. He had to design and make that wing work perfectly. In the process, he had to re rewrite his entire DNA code. Clearly, it was a very intelligent insect. Superbug. Millennia later, a certain carnivorous dinosaur reptile type creature, which completely disappeared without a trace of it in the fossil record, was m walking along and mostly stumbling over the rocks. He just got fed up with always having to struggle and wish that this problem could be solved once and for all. Miraculously and by pure luck, it so happened that he also managed to grow himself a pair of wings. Eons later, it so happened that another reptile scales coincidentally changed into feathers while his frontal limbs completely changed. Miraculously, they looked exactly like wings. The evolutionist Dr. Alan Fudusha admits it's biophysically impossible to evolve flight from such large bipeds with four shortened forelimbs and heavy balancing tails, exactly the wrong anatomy for flight. Not in this fairy tale. Even later, at a time when all the lower life forms were still creeping around, eating worms, one creature, one with a very strong wool, managed to stand up. He just got tired of the messy lives that his nocturnal cave brothers were living and decided that he would rise up above the rest. He grew himself a pair of wings and flew outside where he discovered himself to be a bat. However, he quickly realized that he needed a bit more than a pair of wings in his new occupation. He then completely redesigned his mouth and ears and developed his own personal radar system. Isn't that fantastic? Maybe that's where pilots come from. I get the feeling we still have a lot to learn from these low creatures and that we certainly need to work on having a stronger will. Unfortunately, all these creatures completely disappeared from the fossil record without leaving any sign or trace of their presence or existence. On a more serious note, let's summarize. According to the evolutionary hypothesis, wings in insects bats, reptiles and birds evolved separately from a flightless organism of which there is absolutely no evidence 
in the fossil record. In other words, the fossil record sheds no light on the alleged evolution of flight in insects, reptiles or bats. The oldest known bats are indistinguishable from modern day ones. The evolutionist Paul Serino admits, for use in understanding the evolution of vertebrate flight, the early record of pterosaurs and bats is disappointing. Their most primitive representatives are fully transformed as capable flyers. In other words, the fossil record clearly shows that a bat is a bat is a bat. Evolutionists state that similarities undeniably point to common ancestry. But you've seen that this is not true because close similarity is often found in creatures which evolutionists agree that common ancestry cannot be the explanation. Then they conjure up a new term, convergent evolution, in an attempt to explain away this problem. So, similarity with common ancestry is evidence for evolution. And similarity without common ancestry is evidence for evolution. Whatever similarity they find is to them evidence of evolution. Blind faith based upon the arbitrary assumption that natural processes can explain everything, even convergence, how impossible this might be. But to give the impossible a new name still doesn't make it a possibility. I would really like to grow my own pair of wings. But by defining it as convergent evolution and then waiting and hoping and thinking for a long time does not make the impossibility thereof change into a possibility. When reading an article such as Evolution Mimicry Meets the Mitochondrion, the impression is given that the organism itself is able to accomplish mimicry. Stated differently, that a thoughtless creature carefully observed another for a while and then proceeded to develop similar structures to that of his neighbor, copycat. Some butterflies are very poisonous, which is why birds ignore them. Evolutionists propose that other butter butterflies mimic the warning patterns of these unpalatable butterflies in order to protect themselves. Some people would like to have darker hair, while others would prefer any hair. Some would like to be taller and Others would like green eyes instead of blue eyes. Yet we don't know how to change our genetic recipe to make that happen. How can we expect a butterfly to be able to do this? Mimicry is simply another example of random adjustments, adaptations of an organism to its environment. By natural selection, giving it a competitive advantage for survival and again, this provides no evidence for evolution. Vestigial organs, they call it vestigial, which means undeveloped, incomplete, left over, remnant. Hereby, they propose that humans have a whole collection of organs which according to the evolutionists are incomplete and undeveloped, a mere remnant of our evolutionary and ancestral monkey business days and which we apparently have no need for anymore. According to Newman, you have no less than 180 so-called remnant, incomplete, unnecessary organs and structures in your body. So your body is really like a museum filled with antiques, according to them. Living creatures, including man, are virtual museums of structures that have no useful function, but which represent the remains of organs that once had some use. To date, however, not a single evolutionist has been willing to sacrifice even one of those unnecessary organs. First of all, you can never prove whether an organ is unnecessary, since its function may de be determined at a later stage, as have happened with more than a hundred so far. Furthermore, if the alleged vestigial organ really was unnecessary and no long longer needed, it would prove devolution, not evolution. What the evolutionist really needs is nascent organs, organs that are increasing in complexity to prove their hypothesis. Let's have a look at a few of the so-called vestigial organs and why the number have shrunk from 180 in 1890 to zero in 1999. 
The most common definition of a vestigial organ throughout the last century was similar to the following. Living creatures, including man, are virtual museums of structures that have no useful function but which represents the remains of organs that once had some use. Since it is now a known fact, a well-known fact, that there are no vestigial organs, the evolutionists do what they usually do and conjure up a new definition of vestigial. Any part of an organism that has diminished in size during its evolution because the function it served decreased in importance or became totally unnecessary. Examples are the human appendix and the wings of the ostrich. Yet they never define how much reduction is required before the, la the label vestigial is applied. 1%, 3%, 80.7%. Furthermore, there are so many examples of reduction that the label vestigial itself actually becomes useless. As mentioned before, this rather proves the occurrence of devolution, not evolution. Let's have a look at a few examples. The two tonsils or glands at the back of your throat help to protect you against infections and are known to increase resistance to throat infections. Tonsillectomy is the most frequently performed piece of surgery. Doctors once thought tonsils were simply useless evolutionary leftovers and took them out thinking that it could do no harm. Today there is considerable evidence that there are more troubles in the upper respiratory tract after tonsil removal than before. And doctors generally agree that simple enlargement of tonsils is hardly an indication for surgery. The appendix is one of the most popular alleged useless organs. Science has piled up still further evidence for its case. It has found a number of useless organs among many animals. They have no apparent function and must therefore be a vestige or of a once useful part of the body. A long time back, these vestigial organs must have been important. Now they are just reminders of our common ancestry. One example is the vermiform appendix, which not only is utterly useless in human beings, but which often causes great distress. However, you really need your appendix since it forms part of your immune system. Strategically located at the entrance of the almost sterile ileum, from the colon, which is normally has a high bacterial content, it plays an important role in controlling bacteria entering the intestines. Similar to the tonsils, the appendix also wards off infections. Now, when looking at these two organs, one can draw an interesting conclusion. The human feeding channel is like a long pipe all the way from your mouth to your exhaust. Close to each of these openings, the designer placed a special organ to protect you against infections, similar to placing a soldier on guard. According to Science News, it is now an established fact that both the tonsils and the appendix serve to protect us against Hodgkin's disease. How many times have you been told that your coccyx is the spot where your eight tail used to be? Scientists have meanwhile discovered that there they are very important muscles attached to these bones. Without those muscles, the organs in your abdomen would have fallen out. And you would also not be able to do a number two when you have to. Furthermore, you would not be able to walk or sit upright. So hold on tight to your coccyx. Overall, the concept of evolutionary vestigial organs is useless, speculative and ultimately not good science. It is the sheer universality of perfection, the fact that everywhere we look, to whatever depth we look, we find an elegance and ingenuity of an absolutely transcending quality, which so mitigates against the idea of chance. Is it really credible that random processes could have constructed a reality, the smallest element of which a functional protein or gene is complex beyond our own creative capacities, a reality which is the very antithesis of chance, which excels in every sense anything produced by the intelligence of man. Alongside the level of ingenuity and complexity exhibited by the molecular machinery of life, even our most advanced artifacts appear clumsy. 
Now, why do so few people know about this? First of all, if anyone ever tells you again that people who believe in the literal six-day creation by God are uninformed, remember the foundational role that creation scientists have played during the 17th, 18th and 19th century and what they've accomplished. If science contradicts religion, how do atheists and evolutionists explain the fact that most of the great scientists in history believed in God, took the Bible seriously and were creationists? Far more people are aware of this, especially scientists, than you may think. We are certainly not the only ones to know about this. It may surprise you that even if people know about creation science, they still choose not to believe it. If you really want to know the truth, you'll have to put in some effort to find it, and most people simply don't have the time or don't really care enough about it. Research and publications in this field are not accepted in well-known secular scientific journals. It is nearly impossible to obtain funding for scientific research if it opposes the reigning evolutionary paradigm. Furthermore, creationism does not receive the wide publicity and support via media and television coverage that evolution does. I mentioned earlier that creation scientists stand a real chance of losing their employment if they attempt to pu publish articles supporting creation. They are openly criticized, ostracized, and often even discredited. Most people have no idea how dangerous the teaching of evolution really is. They don't realize that it can destroy especially a child's faith in God's word. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he would drown in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world because of offenses, for offenses must come. But woe to that man by whom the offenses comes. Let's have a final look at some summarized evidence against evolution. The fact that energy can neither be created nor destroyed, but only change from one form into another. First law of thermodynamics. The impossibility of nothing changing into something. The law of cause and effect. The impossibility of non-living matter producing living organisms as confirmed by the law of biogenesis. The fact that order tends towards increasing disorder, entropy, not vice versa, as confirmed by the second law of thermodynamics. The impossibility of chance or random formation of DNA molecules, amino acids, proteins or the cell and other irreducibly complex organ structures and systems. The complete absence of evidence in the past or present of any changes between different kinds, one kind changing into another kind as proven through the fossil record. The impossibility of natural selection to bring forth new kinds. The impossibility of mutations singularly or collectively bringing forth new kinds. The fact that there is no other mechanism other than mutations or natural selection which possibly could have produced transitional forms and none appear in the fossil record as mentioned. The fact that changes within kinds is not evolution but adaptation through natural selection from an already existent gene pool. The wonderful, purposeful and intelligent design of everything in nature point to a supremely intelligent master designer. The first and second law of thermodynamics, the law of cause and effect as well as the law of biogenesis, provide irrefutable evidence against the possibility of inorganic or organic evolution. I can just imagine the frustration this must cause to some people since they clearly indicate the impossibility of evolution as the reason for everything in existence. And the second law also clearly points to the fact that the universe had a beginning and what has a beginning must have a cause. In other words, something could not have been produced from nothing by natural processes. It could not have organized itself and non-living matter can never give rise to living beings. When looking at the evidence from an evolutionary worldview, we see a purposeless chance event idea, providing no reason for us to even be here since we came about due to an accidental cosmic burp. 
We have no purpose or reason to obey any moral values. Yet no scientist can provide any explanation of how the first living organisms originated from non-living matter. The fossil record is characterized by the complete absence of transitional forms or missing links that are supposed to validate evolution. You see, the scientific evidence really is quite unimportant and irrelevant because evolution simply must be true. Moreover, I've never heard of a person who said that evolution brought him or her closer to God. Before his death, convicted mass murderer Jeffrey Dahmer, considered by many to be a, the most notorious killer of all time, made the following comment on the Dateline NBC program in 1994. If a person doesn't think that there is a God to be accountable to, then what's the point of trying to modify your behavior to keep it within acceptable ranges? That's how I thought anyway. I always believed that, that, that the theory of evolution is as truth, that we all just came from the slime. When we died, you know, that was it. There is nothing. And I've since come to believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is truly God. And I believe that I, as well as everyone else, will be accountable to him. Also look at the following shocking quote by Richard Dawkins. He is gen generally seen as the undisputed high priest of evolution and atheism. This quote is from his book, The God Delusion. And this is the one quote throughout this series, which I will not read out loud because of the shockingly blasphemous wording. But I will give you enough time to read it yourself. Richard Dawkins, the high priest, poster boy of evolution. From the molecular level to the cosmological level, evolutionists have issued reckless and severely flawed statements. For example, evolutionists have stated that 98% of our DNA is junk because they knew nothing about it. And more importantly, it didn't fit into their hypotheses as explained in the lecture on human evolution. We now know that they were wrong. And as stated by Professor John Mattick, University of Queensland, the failure to recognize the implications of the non-coding DNA will go down as the biggest mistake in the history of molecular biology. On the other hand, evolutionary cosmologists have stated that 96% of the universe consists of unobservable, invisible stuff, dark matter and dark energy, something which they also know nothing about but simply choose to believe exists. Yet, Nobel laureate Stephen Chu stated, we now understand nearly all there is to know about the universe except for a few small details like what is dark energy and dark matter, which allegedly make 96% of the stuff of the universe. Some have even suggested that non-coding RNA, this is the so-called 98% junk DNA, is the dark matter of genomes. If they were wrong about 98% of our DNA, something that can actually be observed and studied, how can we trust that they are right about 96% of the universe? Something that cannot be observed nor studied and which they admit they know absolutely nothing about. Such elaborate, audacious statements, claiming to know everything about nothing. What else have they been wrong about and will they ever admit to their blind faith? Well, one person did. One of the world's leaders in evolutionary biology, the geneticist and self-proclaimed Marxist Richard Lewontin, openly and frankly admitted to his blind faith in evolution. Our willingness to accept scientific claims that are against common sense is the key 
to an understanding of the real struggle between science and the supernatural. We take the side of science, in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs, in spite of its failure to fulfill many of its extravagant promises of health and life, in spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for unsubstantiated just-so stories, because we have a prior commitment, a commitment to materialism. Moreover, that materialism is absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. Someone once said, if I didn't believe it, I wouldn't have seen it. Hebrews 11.3, by faith we understand that the words were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. There is only one God, the unchanging creator and ruler of the universe, and his moral law, the Ten Commandments, forms the foundation of his governance. Humanity would in all probability have had no problem in acknowledging him as the creator if he did not require any obedience to his authority. According to Romans 7, 7, the moral law is the definition of sin. And because of our sin, we need Jesus as our savior. When looking at the evidence from a biblical perspective, we find overwhelming evidence for the biblical flood and the young earth. The origin of life and the intelligent design of all the various systems cannot be explained according to existing natural laws, but fall beyond their boundary. All throughout this series, we've learned a lot about the first six days of creation, yet we've hardly touched on the seventh day, the crowning day of creation. Now, I'm painfully aware of the fact that what I'm going to talk about now is a serious bone of contention in the church today. I understand that since I only learned about this a few years ago myself. As always, the decision is in your hands. God created the world and the universe in six literal days, and the seventh day he created as a day of rest. To illustrate how our days of work versus rest should be organized, work for six and rest on the seventh day. The six literal days of creation is linked to the six literal weekdays, which is why the Sabbath is inextricably linked to creation. And remember, God said rest on the seventh day. The is a definite article. So this is not a seventh day of your own choosing. The seventh day is and always has been on a Saturday, not a Sunday, which is the first day. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son nor your daughter nor your male servant nor your female servant nor your cattle nor your stranger who is within your gates for in six days the lord made the heavens and the earth the sea and all that is in them and rested the seventh day therefore the lord blessed the sabbath day and hallowed it now what does this rest mean some people say that only God rested on the seventh day after creation, but God does not become tired or weary. Have you never heard? Have you never understood? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of all the earth. He never grows weak or weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. God instituted the Sabbath for mankind, who spent that very first Sabbath in his glorious presence to rejoice in the creation with their creator. The Sabbath is a sign between us and our creator to show that we bow before his authority, his commandments, and not the commandments of men. It is the day where we can focus on our relationship with our Creator without the interruption of any weekly challenges so that we can be refreshed and strengthened by the source of all strength. And remember, the Sabbath was instituted in the beginning, before any specific population groups existed. 
Thus it is for all created mankind to focus primarily on our relationship with our Creator. Although many people believe that the Sabbath has been changed from the seventh day, Saturday, to the first day, which is on Sunday, at Christ's resurrection, there is not a single verse in the Bible to support this notion, including the nine verses in the New Testament referring to the first day. In Revelation 1.10, for example, John speaks of being in the Spirit on the Lord's day. There is then an erroneous cross-reference to Acts 20 verse 7, which deals with the first day. In this way, the idea is created that the first day is the Lord's day. However, the Lord's day was defined thousands of years earlier in, amongst other places, Isaiah. Before Bible translations with sometimes faulty cross-references were even in existence. These translations were only done in the 1500s and 1600s AD. Now this verse also provides beautiful insights of how the Sabbath should be kept. If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor him, not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words. Then you shall delight yourself in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth, and feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. Turner in his article Creation in Isaiah clearly agrees with the fact that the Sabbath is a commemoration to God's creation work, a special day to honor God as our Creator. He writes, The need for the observation of the Sabbath for man, beast, and the land is frequently enjoined. This last provides for the refreshment and renewal of these principal parts of the creation. Such consideration should be of value to modern ecologists. In conclusion, on the seventh day Sabbath and obedience to God's law in general. There is of course a lot more to be said on this subject. Jesus kept the Sabbath, as did all of the disciples, including after his ascension. So clearly it was not a spiritual rest, nor simply an Old Testament teaching. And Jesus said that if we love him, we should walk as he had walked. And if we love him, we should keep the commandments as he had kept them. Because this is the fruits of our redemption. Obedience because we are saved. Not obedience so that we can be saved. For we are saved by grace, by Jesus our Savior, for good works. Works characterized by obedience to the commandments. And there are ten of them not nine, written in stone by the hand of God. In other words, they are eternal. The Christian faith is a logical faith, with evidence in wondrous events as well as fulfilled prophecies. Evolution is blind faith. No one has ever observed life arising from non-living particles. No one has ever observed inanimate, non-living matter changing into moral, living right-thinking beings. Mythology and legends are not found in the Bible, but rather on television channels and in many scientific magazines and even in primary and high school textbooks. Evolution is just a fairy tale for adults. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you, be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. So what lies ahead? Now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete. 
But then I will know everything completely, just as God now knows me completely. What's even more fantastic is that the next time God creates, we will see it with our very own eyes. Then seeing really will be believing. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared. And the one sitting on the throne said, Look, I am making everything new. I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Here are they who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they might have the right to the tree of life, and may enter through the gates into the city. The origin and design of the universe cannot be explained by natural causes. Since we know that the universe had a beginning, and what has a beginning must have a cause, we know that intelligence was required to generate the complex coded information we know of today. Design requires a designer. And since we also know that there was no material intelligent designer for life, it is logical and legitimate to invoke a non-material designer for life, a designer who is able to form miracles by the power of his word. Although we cannot use science to describe how miracles happen, this is irrelevant to the fact that miracles are possible and knowable. Sean Doyle explains that miracles are not necessarily violations of laws of nature, but rather additions to them. I want to end off with the words of Dwight K. Nelson. Young Christian, do not jettison your faith. Reason does not demand it. Long time believer, do not abandon your Bible. Skeptic, please reconsider the evidence. Thank you so much for taking part in this journey with me. I really pray that this information will be a great blessing to you. Thank you.